Okay, our last talk this afternoon will be by uh, March Bodihajo, Yo, sorry, and his title is Spectral Norm and Strong <coughs> Freeness. Thank you very much. All right, the main object of study in this presentation is the Gaussian series random matrix. Uh, more precisely, there are those random matrices that can be written as a sum of GKAK. The GKs are IID standard normal, the AKs are deterministic, whereas the GK are scalars. Uh, there are many classical examples of Gaussian series random matrix. Uh, there's the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. There's the sparse Gaussian where we have a matrix where most of the entries are zero. Uh, but for the non-zero prescribed entries, they are ID standard Gaussian. There's also Gaussian toplitz where we randomize uh, the entries in the toplitz matrix. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. So, so this is the outline of this presentation. In the first part, I will give a classical estimate of Gaussian series random matrix using the non-commutative Kinchin inequality. And in the non-commutative Kinchin inequality, the estimate for the spectral norm involves a dimension factor. Uh, the main results concerning the spectral norm removes the dimension factor in many cases. And as an application, we'll present uh, a resolution of the matrix Spencer conjecture up to a polylogarithmic rank. In the second part of this presentation, uh, I'll present our main results concerning strong freeness, and we give an example concerning sparse Gaussian matrices, and we give what we uh, proved concerning the Peterson Palm conjecture. And in the last part of this presentation, I uh, give two proofs. The combinatorial proof is more intuitive, but it doesn't work uh, when we try to prove strong asymptotic freeness, and it's only the analytic proof will work uh, when we try to prove the strong asymptotic freeness. All right, so this is a classical estimate for the spectral norm of an arbitrary Gaussian series random matrix. Uh, this sign means that the inequality holds up to a uh, multiplicative factor by universal constant. So we have a lower bound and upper bound, and as you can see, the lower bound and upper bound only differ by square root log dimension. And so as the dimension gets large, um, you know, this thing would, could become infinity. But there are many cases including the case where we have a GUE matrix, for example, uh, this dimension factor is not needed in the upper bound. But there are also other cases like uh, certain diagonal matrices where this dimension factor is sharp. So our goal is to identify a large class of cases where we can remove the dimension factor so that it will be sharp and it is still true. All right, so <coughs> the question here is, when is the dimension factor needed in the upper bound? When is it not needed? So here are two opposite extreme examples. In the first example, we have a diagonal random matrix where all the, ent all the diagonal entries are ID standard Gaussian. In this case, uh, we do need the dimension factor in the upper bound because expectation of z squared is identity, whereas the spectral norm is the largest uh, diagonal entry in absolute value, which is of order squared log z. So as you can see, the first one is of order one, and that one is of order squared log dimension. So we do need the dimension factor in the upper bound. On the other hand, if we have all the entries being ID in the Gaussian, uh, then the norm is approximately two, whereas the expectation of z square in this case is equal to identity. So this is of magnitude one, this is two, and because they're same order, uh, the dimension factor is not needed in the upper bound. So what is a feature 
that distinguishes these two opposite extreme examples. Uh, Julia Traub proposed that it is because of non-commutativity or commutativity that makes uh, this difference. In the first case, it's very commutative in the sense that if we take an independent copy of Z called as Y, Y and Z will commute almost surely. Whereas in the second case, uh, if we take an independent copy of Z called as Y, Y and Z, not only that they don't commute, they will be asymptotically free. And Joel Trott was proposing that it's because of this feature that affects whether or not the dimension factor is needed or not in the upper bound. All right, so this is a quote that I copied from Joel Trott's monograph. He was proposing that well, if there's more commutativity in the random matrix, it's more likely that we need the dimension factor in the upper bound. Whereas if there's less commutativity, more non-commutativity, then you know, in the in certain expansion, there will be more cancellation, and so uh, we don't need the dimension factor in the upper bound. So can we identify a large class? Uh, and because he is an applied mathematician, a large class of matrix easily computable quantity that can decide whether or not we need a dimension factor there or not. Okay, so of course that question is rather vague because commutativity or non-commutativity is a qualitative notion and we're trying to prove something quantitative. And he was proposing in a subsequent paper that maybe in the primary term we can uh, remove the dimension factor and then put the dimension factor in the secondary term. And then the secondary term will measure non-commutativity in the sense that if there is enough non-commutativity involved, it will be the secondary term will be overwhelmingly dominated by the primary term. But then if the secondary term is relatively small, only the first term counts. If only the first term counts, then as you can see, the dimension factor is already removed. So we get a, a sharp estimate for the second norm. Okay, but once again, commutativity or non-commutativity is a qualitative notion and we aim to put this as a quantitative notion. And again, this is still not a yes or no uh, true false conjecture. It was proposing that this quantity, if you put that into this inequality, it might hold true. Okay, and it, if you look, try some examples, you do indeed see that when you compare this quantity with the primary term, it is relatively small when there's enough non-commutativity. Okay, so this is the yes, no conjecture, uh, whether up to a constant, this inequality is true. And this conjecture was shown to be true uh, for many cases, including the case, most important case, where all the entries are independent, but not ID uh, Gaussian. So the variance profile can be arbitrary. And in that case, already several hundred citations. And if this conjecture were to hold true in the most general case, then we can generalize this to, a, uh, to an inequality that gives a sharp estimate for a wide range of random matrices and it's easy to use because all these quantities are, uh, that one and that one are very, very easily computable in many cases. All right, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's shown to be not true. We give a counter example, we construct a random matrix that breaks this inequality. So if we go back, if this one doesn't work, well, maybe if this one doesn't work, maybe there's another quantity that quantifies non-commutativity that it would work, okay, maybe. But we show that if you have any reasonable uh, measure of non-commutativity, there will be a counterexample. And why are these four properties reasonable? Well, this one satisfies the triangle inequality this one kind of satisfies the triangle inequality. And so it's reasonable to ask that quantity 
to satisfy the triangle inequality. Second, non-commutativity should be invariant on the change of basis. So if you conjugate by a unitary, it should be the same. And third, A and B commute if and only if A tends to I commutes with B tends to I. So if you tensor up by identity, there's still the same amount of non-commutativity there. So it's invariant under that uh, tensoring up by identity. And fourth, what we want is that when there is enough non-commutativity, we want the second term to be relatively small compared to the first term. And we only require that the second term to be mildly small in the most non-commutative case where all the entries are I and B standard Gaussian. Mildly small, I mean just little O of uh, one over poly log of dimension. Then already, whenever it satisfies these four, uh, there will be a counter example that breaks the inequality. And in particular, this uh, uh, quantity that was proposed in the conjecture I showed you before. And so there is a counterexample when you plug this into that. All right, so this is not the end of the story. Uh, uh, today we're going to have a happy ending. All right, before it was shown to be false, uh, Joel Schwab was attempting to prove that conjecture. And this is an important step towards that, even though eventually it became false. It was able to reduce the square log dimension to log b power one fourth, and then plus another term that measures non-commutativity. And as stated in its paper, this quantity that quantifies non-commutativity was inspired uh, by free probability. I mean, in free probability, we have the crossing terms, and that's precisely that z1, z2, z1, z2. This, uh, this is the quantity that captures the crossing terms, and because of some technical reason, we have to insert some unitaries in between. Okay. Now, once we have that, uh, this inequality is indeed true. It's a theorem, okay, not a conjecture. And as a quick example, let's look at the case where all the entries are ID in the Gaussian. Uh, if we put this, apply this result to this matrix, uh, that thing will be one. So that's why log b power one fourth. The wz in this case would be d to the power minus one quarter. And so if you multiply by square log d is still relatively small, we can neglect that. So only the first term counts, but even though it's better than the estimate using the non-commutative pinch inequality where we get square log D, it's an improvement, but there's still a dimension factor, okay? Because the correct estimate is approximately two. Okay, uh, before I move on, I just want to put a slide explaining why this quantity does mention non-commutativity in some sense when we compare it to the first term. <coughs> because that quantity that Joel Schwab proposed is always dominated by the first term. And in the commutative case, we have equality. And in the most non-commutative case, where all the entries are ID and the Gaussian, it's, uh, it's a strict, very strict inequality. This one will be d power one fourth. That one will be square root d. So in the commutative case, it will be equality. In the very non-commutative case, it's a strict inequality. So in that sense, if we compare that second term to the first term, it does quantify uh, non-commutativity. Okay. All right, so let me just sum up. <coughs> so the results by Joel Trop in around 2015 uh, as I said, it's not sharp because there's still a dimension factor remaining in the primary term. Um, and second issue is that the second term WZ, the one with Z1, Z2, Z1, Z2, uh, it's very hard to compute in practice, even for the case where all the entries are ID and the Gaussian, uh, it takes around a page to compute WZ. Uh, we're able to resolve the second issue concerning computability. Uh, we get an estimate, and this estimate is pretty sharp in many cases. 
So what is the covariance of Z here? Well, Z is a random matrix. So you can treat the random matrix as a random vector. It's just a random vector with D square entries. And by treating the random matrix as a random vector, the covariance matrix will be a D square by D square deterministic matrix. And then we can take the special norm of that. Okay. All right, so this is a very computable quantity because this is a deterministic matrix. This is deterministic matrix. So, you know, expectation inside the norm, then it's easy to compute. Okay. But the first issue still remains. There is still a dimension factor in the first term. Okay. All right, so this is our main result concerning special norm. It's published in Invenciona's math this year. Uh, we <coughs> give the sharp constant here too. And this is the second term we put there. So in the case where we have all the entries being I D standard Gaussian, uh, the first term you have two times square root D. And what about the second term? Well, if all the entries are I D standard Gaussian, if you treat the random matrix as a random vector, you have all the entries being I D standard Gaussian. And if that's the case, uh, then the covariance matrix would be like identity if all the entries are I D standard Gaussian. So then you just have one there, the power one half times D to the power one half and then take square root again. So you have D power one fourth. So, even though we didn't get the Tracy Widdom fluctuation, the second term is relatively small when compared to the first term. And not only that, the two in the uh, first term is sharp, as we can see in this example, the correct estimate is approximately two times root D. All right. Now, so far, all the random matrices that I presented so far are Gaussian. And in practice, most of the random matrices are not Gaussian. But as George Prop pointed out, many random matrices that arise in applications can be decomposed as a sum of independent random matrices. And we have an estimate for that. And this estimate is sharp when the ZIs have low rank. Uh, because there's a Frobenius norm. <coughs> and th there is a version of this result that where we don't require low rank. That's by uh, Brylovskaya and Van Handel. But this is beyond the scope of this presentation. But even so, uh, our result doesn't work just for Gaussian. It works the wide range of random matrices, as you can see. It will give sharp estimates for these random matrices. Okay, another application. This is a matrix fancy conjecture from theoretical computer science. <laughs> so, uh, in that conjecture, actually, the number of matrices and the size of the matrix are different. But in the most important case, uh, the number of matrices and the size of the matrix is the same. N number of matrices and uh, n by n matrices. Everything deterministic, okay, nothing random here. Each of them has norm at most one. Can we find plus or minus one signs so that the norm of that is uh, bounded by constant times root n? So this is kind of like the you know discrepancy in Caddis and Singer problem. And you know, you can think of this plus minus one signs as a partition of the index one to n as s and s complement. And then we sum over, we sum up all the matrices in one block of the partition, and then we sum up all the matrices in another block of the partition, and then we see if they are balanced, okay? And to see how balanced it is, we just see the sum over this block and the sum over that block, what's the difference in spectral norm, how small can this be? Okay. And the matrix Spencer conjecture uh, claims that it can be as small as constant times root n. All right, uh, before I move on, I just want to explain why is the constant times root n? So, n is the same n, both the dimension and the Yes, both the dimension 
and the number of matrices. In the most general setting of the matrix Benzer conjecture, there is difference, but in the most important case, uh, it's the same n. All right, uh, let me explain why the root n is needed, because even in the most basic case, you just have a matrix where you have an entry one in the first entry, a first row, ith column, entry one, and the rest of them are zero. In that case, you already need root n because whatever epsilon one to epsilon n you have, sum of epsilon i a i will be E1 transpose times sum of epsilon i e i. And if you take the norm of that, you get the sum of epsilon i e i. And for whatever plus minus one sign, it's always root n, okay? So even in this most basic case, you already need the root n. And the matrix Spencer conjecture claims that in the most general case, root constant times root n will suffice. <laughs> All right. And this is uh, not our results, but some results by theoretical computer scientists uh, published in SARC this year. <laughs> it says that if we impose the assumption that the rank is at most n over log n cube, uh, then the matrix Spencer conjecture will be true. And why is this a mild assumption? Because uh, automatically the rank, the n by n matrices, so automatically the rank will be at most n, and we only need that the rank is at most n over log n cube. So as stated in the abstract of that paper, our, our result concerning random matrix is an essential ingredient in the proof of their result. Before their result, the best known result also by computer scientists was that the rank AI is at most root N, if I remember correctly. If the rank is at most root N, then matrix, conje matrix Spencer conjecture is true. If the rank is at most root N for every AI. Uh, but then with our result, we can, you know, with a completely different proof, uh, we can improve the assumption to this. <laughs> And just want to emphasize again, our result is concerning random matrices, whereas this is everything deterministic, nothing random here, okay? Now, obviously, if you put uh, plus minus one signs, rand uniform plus minus one signs, it, it, it won't work. <laughs> All right. Okay, next test. Uh, this is the second test of this presentation. Uh, Strong asymptotic freeness. Just want to recall this. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of you already know. If you have two random matrices, XD and YD, asymptotic freeness means if you take the normalized trace and you take any non-commuting polynomial in two variables, uh, evaluate at XD and YD, it will converge almost surely to the non-commutative expectation of the polynomial evaluated at uh, freely independent variables. And strong asymptotic freeness uh, means that in addition to this, we need uh, not just the uh, normalized trace converges, the norm of that will converge to the norm of that. Uh, so Wojcicki was the one who proved uh, asymptotic freeness when all the entries are IDs and the Gaussian, and Hargreaves of Janssen uh, was the one who proved strong asymptotic freeness, and the application at the time was that the EXT semi group of the reduced CC algebra of a uh, free group with two generators is not a group. All right, subsequently, uh, many work, and I apologize if you. If you prove something on strong asymptotic freeness, but your name is not there okay. Uh, did I miss anyone? Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, so I should say uh, the proof of weakness, strong freeness of weakness and deterministic, and the proof of hard unitary and deterministic. If I remember correctly, we have to exploit the fact that hard unitary and weakness is a random matrix full of randomness. And if we want to prove strong asymptotic freeness for random permutations, the proof is completely different because there's much less randomness than weakness or hard unitary. Weakness and hard unitary 
your matrix, your random matrix is full of randomness, whereas random permutation, you have much less randomness. And so you need to use a completely different approach. And what I'm going to do is uh, strong asymptotic freeness for sparse Gaussian matrices. And because for sparse matrices, much less randomness, we have to take a third approach completely different from uh, these two, even though we use the hard group called Jamson linearization, linearization trick. Okay, so this is our main result on strong asymptotic freeness. Uh, if we have independent matrices, each of them has joint C Gaussian entries. So joint C Gaussian entries allows that the entries are correlated, okay? Just joint C Gaussian is not ID Gaussian, it's joint C Gaussian, so they, have, they can have correlations. And we just need that to be centered, expectation of the random matrix squared is identity. And of course the random matrix has to be self-adjoint. If we take the covariance matrix, again, we're treating the random matrix as a random vector and take the covariance matrix, take the spectral norm. If it's little O of one, uh, we have asymptotic freeness. If it's little O of log B minus three, we have strong asymptotic freeness. And just a quick example, if we have a random matrix, all the entries are ID standard Gaussian and divide that by root D, what do we get? Well, if all the entries are ID standard Gaussian, treat that random matrix as a random vector, the covariance is something like the identity, but because we divide by square root D, if we take the covariance, we have to divide by D. So if we have a GUE matrix, then the norm of that will be one over D, of all the one over D, but we only require uh, a very mild assumption, not a polynomial decay. We only require uh, poly logarithmic decay, okay? Not a polynomial decay. Then already we have strong asymptotic freeness. <laughs> and because of this mild assumption here, uh, our result, works in the case when we have a sparse Gaussian matrix. And here's the model of a sparse Gaussian matrix. I'm going to describe the sparsity using a regular graph, okay? Suppose you have D vertices and D will go to infinity and each vertex has MD degrees, MD number of edges. Okay, so a regular graph. So if you look at the adjacency matrix of that regular graph, Okay, you, if it is zero, you keep it zero. If it is one, you replace that by I D standard Gaussian, okay? So how sparse it is? Well, in each row, how many non-zero entries there are? Well, the number of non-zero entries in each row of this random matrix is the degree of that vertex, okay? Which is MD, okay? And we only require that MD to be of polylogarithmic growth, okay? Like MD equal to log D power four, okay? So each row only has M log D power four number of non-zero entries. So it's very sparse. In that case, we already have uh, strong asymptotic freeness. Okay? And as far as I know, before our result, even when the MD, the number of non-zero entries in each row, the sparsity is D over log D, even for D over log D, as far as I know, was not even known whether it is strongly asymptotically free before our result, as far as I know. Okay. All right, so next thing, even though we didn't prove the peterson tom conjecture, but just show you what we are able to prove uh, using our result. Uh, ben Hayes showed that you know, if something like this is true, then peterson tom conjecture is true. Uh, so let me first explain this notation. XD and Y, all the XD and Y, these are uh, uh, random matrices, uh, GUE random matrices. XD is D by D, whereas the Y of ND is ND by ND. The I of ND is ND by ND, okay? I of D is D by D identity. If we can do this, for ND equal to D, the same size, then Peterson-Tom conjecture is true. 
uh, but we fail to do that. Uh, we only show that this is true when nd is little o of d over log d cubed. So like d over log d power four, it will work, okay? And of course, you know, later talks, there will be more some more exciting things about this. So. Okay, last part of this presentation. Uh, I'm going to give two proofs of our main results. One is the combinatorial proof. It's more intuitive, but doesn't work when we try to prove strong asymptotic freeness. And I give you the analytic proof, uh, which can be expand, which can be extended using the power groups of Janssen linearization trick to prove strong asymptotic freeness. Okay, first is the combinatorial proof. Uh, if we take that's given random matrix to the power 2p, take the expectation, there's the weak formula, okay? Sum over all the pair partitions, that means a partition that has only two entries in each block. Respecting the partition means that if the block consists of i and j, we need fi to be equal to fj, okay? And then we just take the trace on both sides. Okay, uh, this is the one of the proof of the classical non-commutative Kinch inequality. The blue thing right there is maximized when the partition is given by this. <coughs> and when it is given by that, uh, this blue thing can be simplified as this. So because it's maximized at, in this partition, it's always less than equal to that. And so the blue thing there is always less than equal to this. Once we replace the blue thing there by this, it does not depend on the partition mu anymore. It remains to count the number of pair partition, which is of this order. And then we take P to be log dimension, and then we take both sides to the power one over two P. If we take this thing to the power one over two P, we get square root P. And then if P is log P, we get this. And that's how we, Prove the non commutative Kinch inequality for spectral norm that involves the dimension factor. Okay, so if we don't want to have a dimension factor, then what do we do? We cannot have p power p here because if we have p power p, you take this to the power one over two p, then it will be root p. If it is root p, then there will be dimension factor. But if we, let's say, if we're able to replace p power p by 100 power p, if we have 100 power p, then we are good because we take this to the power one over two p, then we get a constant, okay? So exponential growth is okay, but super exponential growth is not okay. So we have to replace this super exponential growth by exponential growth. That means uh, one way to do it is when we split this sum into sum over all the non-crossing partition plus sum over all the crossing partitions. Non crossing is fine. Uh, there are most two to the power two p number of non crossing partitions, couple of number. And this is okay. If you take this to the power one over two p, you just get a constant here. So what remains is the crossing terms. Now, as you can see, there are many crossing terms, so we cannot use the one using the Butch Holtz upper bound to bound the crossing term. We have to down the crossing term in a better way uh, so that we can remove the dimension factor in the end. All right, if it is crossing, that means there will be I1, I3 that are in the same block, I2, I4 in the same block and then in this order. <coughs> so let's focus our attention on that. Uh, in this list, we just focus our attention on these four terms, I'm not doing anything here, okay? Just focus our attention on these four terms, I'm not doing anything. And because it needs to respect that partition, so fi1 has to be equal to fi3 because i1, i3 in the same block, fi2 has to be equal to fi4, so k2, k2 is the same, k1, k1 is the same, okay? <laughs> All right. And then, so this is what we do on these four terms. And for the rest of the terms, what do we do? How do we get the dot dot dots? The whole thing comes from Wick's formula, okay? We expand the expectation by Wick's formula, and then we get something, the dot dot dots here. 
So what we do is we go back, we use the Wix formula, Wix formula backward, okay? So Wix formula will get you from the random matrix to some combinatorial expansion. Now we have the combinatorial expansion, we go back to random matrix, and this is what I'm going to do. Uh, use the Wix formula backward. Okay, and before I do that, uh, we need the assumption, a technical assumption that all the entries in the AK are non-negative because there will be an overcounting and to realize this overcounting, we need that all the entries are non-negative. And why is that overcounting? Because for each crossing partition new, there is more than one quadruple of I1 to I4, okay? There could be 100 quadruples of I1 to I4 that makes a crossing for each crossing new. So each of the new will appear in more than one of these sums, okay? And, and that's why there's an overcounting. And to realize this overcounting, we need that all the entries are non-negative. But other than that, we just apply the Wix formula backward and we get the random matrix back, okay? The AK, AK1, AK2, AK1, AK2 remains. Uh, the AK1, AK2, AK1, AK2 reminds us of the drop quantity and we can pull out all the z's together because you sum up all the exponents of z's, you get two, two p minus four. The other four terms, are, you put them in the chopped quantity. And so that's the chopped quantity. And then let's sum up. The non-crossing partition, <coughs> we get two power two p. <coughs> For crossing partitions, we get you know, this thing, we put it here. And then so we have 2p, yeah, 2p minus four, we have recursion, okay? And then if we apply this recursion, uh, and then we will get something like this. And then we take p to be log dimension, and this is what we will get, okay? It's not an optimal result, but the proof is pretty intuitive, I think, uh, this combinatorial proof. Okay, next is uh, analytic proof. Before I go to the analytic proof, just recall some preliminary result. That's the non-commutative tension inequality estimate for the spectral norm I presented in the beginning of this talk. Uh, if we replace all the GKs in the random matrix by freely independent semicircular variables SK and the tensor AK, then we don't have a dimension factor in the upper bound, we just have two times that. Uh, intuitively, it's because the semicircle law has compact support, it's supported on minus two to two, and so we don't need a dimension factor in the upper bound, okay? If we replace all the Gaussian by uh, semi freely independent semicircular. So as you can see, the free world is designed to be perfect, okay? It's, there's no dimension factor when we try to bound that. And this is precisely what we need but what we want to prove is concerning random matrices, okay? So what we do is we let Z free to be the twin brother of Z in the free world. By twin brother, I mean I replace all the ID standard Gaussian by freely independent semicircular variables. And then we try to interpolate the original random matrix with its twin brother in the free world. Uh, the free world, as I said, is designed to be perfect. It's the norm is at most two times this, it's a classical result. But the main difficulty uh, in the proof is try to interpolate between the original random matrix and the twin brother in the free world. And the discrepancy from this interpolation uh, gives this thing, okay? So because the free world gives us this term, so we get that plus the discrepancy between the original world and the free world, which is this, we get that, okay? So in fact, we can replace the two times this by norm of Z-free data, okay? All right, so next I'm going to show you how we interpolate Z to Z-free. It's not too hard, probably no, but probably different from uh, the proofs of results like this. Anyway, here's the interpolation. There are two ways to lift the given random matrix Z. One way to lift the given random matrix Z is to put ID blocks of 
ID copies of Z as diagonal blocks, okay, blocks along the diagonal. The other way to lift the random matrix Z is to put ID copies everywhere in the block random matrix. Okay? If you put, put the ID copies along the diagonal, it will have the same uh, expected spectral distribution as the original random matrix Z. If you put it everywhere, as the n goes to infinity, it will converge in distribution to the twin brother of Z in the free world. So as you can see, that's how we interpolate. Take T to be zero, we get the free world. Take T to be one, we get the original world. Okay. All right, next, we want to estimate the spectral norm. So we use the moment method, okay? Uh, we have the classical world minus the free world, which is just integral of this derivative, okay? So what remains is to get an estimate for that derivative. And because everything here is Gaussian, jointly Gaussian, we can apply this classical result concerning Gaussian interpolation, just recall that. If you have two Gaussian vectors, uh, independent and all the entries are independent, but the variance profile could be arbitrary, then uh, derivative of expectation of f of this interpolation is given by this thing involving the second order partial derivative, okay? Now, of course, this is about Gaussian vectors and we're dealing with matrices, so what do we do? We just treat the random matrices as random vectors, okay? By treating random matrices as random vectors, we can apply this Gaussian interpolation. And what remains is to estimate this second order partial derivative. Okay, so what is the F here? F is like the random matrix, the matrix to the power P, X power P, okay? It's a complicated version of X power, Fx is equal to X power P, some ver complicated version of X power P. How do you differentiate X power P? You can use the product rule, right? You can write X power P as a product of P things and then differentiate each one of them, one at a time, but you do it P times and then sum them up. So each of the term would be like sum of GK, AK. And if you take partial derivative with respect to GI, sum of GK, AK, partial derivative with respect to GI, you get AI, okay? But you do that twice. So you get AI here and AI there because you take two second order partial derivatives. And it's not just one term, it's actually P square number of terms like this because we're taking products of P number of terms and then we do it one at a time, but P, P times and then sum them up. If you do it once, because there are P terms one at a time, P times there will be P, but we do it twice, second order partial derivative. So a P square number of terms like this. What remains where we didn't take the derivative are some you know, correlated ga Gaussian random matrices. And because they're correlating the Gaussian, we can apply uh, the Gaussian covariance identity. And what that means is we can differentiate this dot 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 one more time and differentiate that dot 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 one more time. If we differentiate this dot 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 one time, we get the AJ, differentiate that dot 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 one more time, we get AJ. Once we have this, it will remind us of the trop quantity, AI, AJ, AI, AJ. There's something like the trop quantity. So because trop quantity is bounded by that, uh, if we apply the Gaussian interpolation, do this computation with Gaussian covariance identity, everything put together, that's what we get, okay? The P minus four comes from the dot, 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 and then this is the trop quantity. The P power four terms, because they're P square terms when we take second order partial derivative, but then we use the Gaussian covariance identity, differentiate this dot dot and differentiate that dot dot dot, P and P, so we get another P squared, so it's P power four. Solve this differential inequality, we get this, and then we take P to be log dimension, okay? Now, this is only for spectral norm, okay? And if we, Want to prove strong asymptotic freeness, uh, we cannot uh, use this exactly the same proof because uh, that proof only gives us the spectral norm. So how do we apply the Gaussian interpolation to that, uh, to get this? We take the function to be like x power p, we apply the moment method, okay? But if we want to prove something about the spectrum rather than spectral norm, 
we can take use the moment method directly. We have to take the resolvent, okay? <coughs> so the modulus there, modulus of an operator T is square root P star T. Modulus of T is square root P star T. So we are going to apply uh, the same proof, not directly to the moment, but to the moment of the resolvent. Once we apply the same proof to the moment of the resolvent, uh, everything uh, looks the same, but it will be more complicated. And then our result concerning the spectral norm can be improved to bounding the spectrum, the entire spectrum of that random matrix Z. And the error, as you can see, is still the same. It's this plus that, okay? This is something like the Hausdorff uh, distance, okay? But it's one-sided. Once we bound the entire spectrum of the random matrix, Hargrove Pop Janssen's linearization tricks guarantees uh, we get strong asymptotic freeness. Okay, that's the end. <laughs>